want to eliminate autism or reduce the rates, the most high yield way by far is preconception counseling as far as we get the health of the mom and dad as healthy as possible before the child is conceived. Before. That's an important one. Uh, you know, prenatal's nice too. Um, you know, as far as before the baby's born, while the mom's conceiving, it's better than nothing, but preconception is the way to go. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Wellness Cafe. Thank you so much for joining me and Dr. Nikogosian today. Today we are going to be diving into the topic of autism, kind of get the ins and outs of autism and also what to do about it and also what's the conventional approach or what, what's conventional medicine is offering you and your family as far as treatment for autism and also what's the alternative. So um, I'm happy to be here at this beautiful office of Dr. Nico and I'm gonna let him introduce himself um, to the audience. For those of, those of the audience who doesn't know who you are, and, you know, just tell us a little bit about your practice and how you got involved in functional medicine. Sure. Uh, my name is Armin Nikogosian. I'm a medical doctor. Um, I have a, a functional medicine practice in Henderson, Nevada, uh, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. And I got into uh, sort of a biomedical approach to autism or a functional medicine approach which really are the same thing, they're just different ways of saying it. Several years back, um, I originally trained as an internist, um, and uh, I had a standard primary care practice for many years. I uh, went over to the VA, I was uh, chief of primary care at the VA for several years, but uh, in two th 2010, one of my children was diagnosed with autism, and uh, we went through uh, all the uh, usual Kind of conventional evaluations and treatments, which, which were not very much, and essentially uh, I didn't get the answers I wanted. So I took it on myself to research it, and um, I'd always had an interest in what used to be called alternative complementary medicine, and back in the old days, um, you know, and once I once I did this for my son, it really opened my eyes to to a whole new world of medicine, and in, in you know. It didn't you know, expand my toolbox a little. I mean, it tripled, quadrupled, quintupled my toolbox. Uh, so I started, obviously, patient number one was my son. Uh, I started implementing various different therapies uh, when, when he was around four, four to four and a half years old. Uh, you know, now he's nine. You know, he's improved tremendously, far beyond uh, the prognoses I was getting from right. uh, you know, the so-called uh, the best this doctor and the best that doctor and, and so on. Uh, which you know, I don't, I don't hold it as a fault to them. It's, it's more of a limitation in their training. Um, right. And we'll, we'll dive into that, like you know, the things that you're doing for your sons, also your, yep. also your patients. Um, well, that's where know. it expanded out to the patients. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, invariably, uh, I started uh, sort of dipping my toe into it with, with my standard primary care patients, and I started seeing the outcomes in, in the patients who were compliant mm -hmm. and motivated. Um, they were fantastic. I mean, they really were. We were, we were actually reversing diseases that were, according to the conventional medicine dogma, were not reversible diseases. So, wow. Uh, so, you know, once you start seeing that, I mean, it's, it's kind of like in the Matrix, you know, the thing with the two pills. I right. Mean, you, you really, you know, once you understand there's a different, better way to do things. You, you, you can't go back. Not in good conscience. You mm -hmm. can't. There's no way mm -hmm. you can. So, so I, uh, I really, uh, I had, readjusted my whole professional life uh, around that and uh, you know now I'm, I'm doing a full-time functional medicine practice adults and children uh, with on the children and I mean I'm focusing more on developmental delays but uh, but we're also you know we're addressing some gut problems everything you know I make it always clear to my patients I'm not a pediatrician mm -hmm. uh, you know I'm not a primary care pediatrician you know they're, they're bringing their kids they should have a pediatrician but um, but as far as consulting to to give additional dimensions to their treatment or, or different uh, ways of viewing it um, and, and you, know, you know as well as I do I mean the functional medicine viewpoint is, is for, I'd say pretty dramatically different from the conventional medicine viewpoint I mean you're really assessing the patient differently it's a paradigm shift right yeah Absolutely. you're looking way beyond what's presented mm -hmm. you ask the question why that thing is there in the first place so I want to take you back to 
um, the, the day your son was diagnosed and kind of what exactly the response or what kind of you know solutions you were presented with well the initial response like usual is denial um, <laughs> I'll skip that part right um, I, I mean every and I see this in other parents they right all, they all go mm -hmm. through that mm -hmm. uh, you know then they usually go through an anger phase you know all the stages of grief um, uh, the, the one people you a lot of times get caught up I was caught up on it a little bit my own was uh, feeling sorry for yourself uh, how did this happen to me? Mm. Never mind the little Vic kid who can't talk. Victim right? mentality. Yeah, mm. I think uh, you know the efforts need to be focused on the kid. Right. Um, and and so you know and you know finally when you get through all that you can actually get something done. So uh, that's something I always look for in the patient's parents. Uh, you know they got to get through these stages because unfortunately they're going to be limited in how they can help their kid until they do. So they got to work through that. And once they're through that then you can get to work getting your kid better. You know, so. so what was the solution that was, were presented to you? It was just like, well, um, sorry, we can't do anything about it, or what kind of things that... The conventional, you know, yeah. so from a conventional standpoint, mm -hmm. the toolbox is very limited. Uh, FDA-approved treatments for autism right now are two things, Risperdone and Abilify, which are both antipsychotics. Um, and, and I could, in, in extreme cases, I think of severe autism where, you know, you have a child who's, you know, hurting himself, uh, you know, he's, he's very uh, destructive or, or, you know, I think it has a role. Mm. I think it's a very narrow role. Of course. But uh, it, it's certainly there. Uh, you know, to give an antipsychotic to slow down a child's brain because he claps his hands too much or interrupts once in a while, you know, to me, that's, that's crazy, you know, mm. it's, so, so beyond that, uh, there's ABA therapy, uh, and then sort of the usual slew of speech therapy, occupational therapy, which I'm actually a big uh, proponent of. I think they're very important, but they're very, very operator dependent. Um, you know, the skill of the practitioner delivering it, it, it makes everything. It, it makes or breaks the therapy, unfortunately. So. In Las Vegas, we, you know, there were some limited options. We did find some good people to help, uh, which which was very helpful. But it didn't take very long where you know, I could see that nobody was looking at my son like there was anything neurologically or medically wrong with him. Uh, you know, the conventional approach is it's a psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, it's a subjective DSM-5 diagnosis. Just about every other Diagnosis, whether it be diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, they're objective diagnosis. There's an objective finding, a high blood sugar, uh, high blood pressure, you know, a number, something you can measure. Autism, for whatever reason, got put into the psychiatric category early on and it stayed there along with depression and schizophrenia, uh, mood disorders, all those other things, which are subjective. There's nothing measurable. There's a psychiatrist or psychologist or, or some sort of practitioner who's determining a checklist of behaviors and saying, oh, you meet that criteria, that one, that one, this kid's got autism. And there's something to be said for that as far as classification, but that, uh, that, that different viewpoint and diagnosis where they've, where they've decided to just do it differently has, in my opinion, has significantly hampered efforts to really get answers what you can do with autism. Because what it's done is it's it's created really a, a large group of very different causes all to be clumped under one diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So you take, you know, 100 kids with autism, you practically have 100 different causes, you know, or at least 50 different causes. Uh, maybe if you're lucky, 20 different causes, but certainly you're not going to have 100 kids with one cause. Mm -hmm. it's, that's not what autism is. It's, it's, it's a variety of different subtypes with a lot of overlapping and the problem is, again, when you, if you're going to be doing a study, you could have some sort of intervention, which for three out of those hundred kids, it, it's going to be a game changer. But for the other 97, it doesn't do anything. Because nobody asked the question why, like you said earlier. Right. Uh, instead, they just classed them by these behaviors, clumped them all together, and then the, the study shows statistically insignificant, and then whatever that intervention was gets shelved, and that's that. Never mind that for those three kids that it did help, it changed their lives, literally. Right. Um, so, unfortunately, when you have a diagnosis that, in my, again, is not, it doesn't accurately reflect the actual ideology of the disorder, uh, 
uh, it, it really hampers moving forward with trying to find what you can do with this. And I, unfortunately, I don't know what we can do about that because the, the way the diagnosis is set is it's very firmly established now. Um, very disempowering too. It is, it is. Yeah. I mean, what I, in my practice, I, I, I break down the subtypes, you know. I mean, the subtypes are, uh, you, you definitely have a syndromic subtype, which uh-huh. is genetic cause. You know, the kid's got a fragile X syndrome or Engelman's or Down syndrome, something like that, and then they also get the diagnosis of autism. That's anywhere from, depends who you ask, 5 to 20%, and anywhere in that range. But those, t- those are tough cases. You can still do something with them because... Invariably, they'll have something wrong on their matrix, right? Their gut will be leaky or immune system will be opposite. So you can, you can still work with that, but usually the, the uh, improvements are more limited than we'll see in other subtypes. Mm. Uh, another subtype is autoimmune. Um, that it, it, we don't really have percentages on that. I mean, it's really this conversation just begun about this the last several years. In my opinion, I think it's a pretty big segment. Um, if you look at the incidence of other autoimmune diseases increasing, it's mirrored, um, not, not as intense as autism, but it, it's also mirrored in that same time. Uh, it's kind of coincided with expansion of the vaccination schedule, the introduction of GMO foods, uh, you know, increased glyphosate usage, uh, you know, more mercury coming over from China in the air, and at least on the West Coast. I, I mean, there's a lot of factors you right. know, that go into this. There's no one factor, I would say. Um, there's definitely a mitochondrial subtype uh, which is not, uh, you know, mitochondrial disease is a fairly rare entity. It's, it was really only discovered in the early 90s. Uh, frank disease, the, these you know, poor kids that have this usually don't make it past a year or two of age. However, mitochondrial dysfunction is different. Like everything else, it's a spectrum. So, you know, you have people who have extremely efficient mitochondria. Though I guess I should probably define mitochondria. Mitochondria are the, the part of the cell that produces energy. So extremely important uh, for everything, especially the brain. Mm-hmm. The brain's sort of a, a bit of an energy hog in our body. It uses lots of energy. Uh, so when you have a dysfunction, uh, one of the first organs that will be affected is the brain, uh, especially in a child who's developing. So uh, we evaluate for that as well. Uh, there's definitely a toxic subtype. Uh-huh. Um, toxic is a kind of broad term because it, you know I, I include sort of infection in that, like biotoxin. Uh, it, you know, there's the classic mercury, arsenic, aluminum. You know, the, all the those type of heavy metals. Uh, heavy aluminum is not heavy metal, but uh, metals, I should say. Uh, but I think there's also your chronic infections. Uh, we'll see that's with strep, Lyme. Uh, with strep, it sometimes expresses pandas. There's a lot of uh, pandas uh, is a kind of post-infectious autoimmune response. You know, and again, this is where I'm talking. These different subtypes, there's so much overlap. Because yes. the toxic, like for instance, if if a child has pandas, it, it's sort of a toxic subtype. It's sort of an autoimmune subtype. And on top of that, then he has a subjective presentation of of autism per the DSM-5. So so it gets it gets murky. Right. You're trying to sort these things out. Um, and but. But it's actually essential that you classify the child properly as far as, you know, what, what is the leading cause. And sure, there'll be overlap, but, you know, you go, f- you go for the highest probability things first and obviously the, the, the least risky treatments. Right, so you have all these different subtypes, yeah. that, which are, uh, what, syndromic? That's mm-hmm. genetic pre- predisposition, right? Yep. And mitochondrial dysfunction, you have autoimmune component, toxic... And uh, what's that one? Infection. Well, yeah, an, an infection. I kinda, I, well, inflammatory is that's more of a generalized one. Uh, before I, would, there's sort of another one that I. It's not really officially classified. It's just the way I view it. It's sort of I call it immunomethylating. It's there's obviously immune dysfunction. It doesn't seem to be as severe as autoimmune. These kids usually are highly allergic. They have asthma. They have allergies. They'll kind of break out in hives for random reasons. They have, to have this really uh, exaggerated immune response. From my clinical experiences, invariably these kids are typically are poor methylators. So methylation is essentially this system in our body. It's sort of like the way I describe it to my patients. It's like the economy of the body. You know, uh, the you know we use dollars and we got the Federal Reserve and our banking system and all right. that. 
you know, dollars are our medium of exchange. That's how our economy works. And in our body, methylation is basically, the methyl group is that medium of exchange for communication between systems, whether that be turning on and off genes or making neurotransmitters or getting rid of waste or detoxification. It's, it's, a, it's a means for that economy to work. So it's important. And you know, a lot of people are probably familiar with it through MTHFR. That's mm -hmm. a commonly tested SNP. And, and that's part of the picture, certainly, but it's, it's far more complicated than MTHFR. There's various other genetic SNPs involved in there. Or, or, uh, SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, or, which is it's like a point mutation. Now, you know, that may sound confusing because we're talking about syndromic being a genetic right. thing. Let me just quickly kind of explain that. Uh, yes, the, the SNPs we're talking about are genetic, but these are usually point mutations. This is usually a single, uh, single enzyme it's coding for. Sometimes it has multiple functions, sometimes it's a single function. With syndromic, we're talking about a whole chromosome being missing. We're talking about large fields of genetic information repeating. Over and over and over again. So it's so it's it's very different. The syndromic is sort of like a very widespread genetic issue. Where really, from our intervention perspective, and you know at least at our current status, mm -hmm. and that may change with CRISPR in the future. But as it stands now, there's not a whole lot we could do for that. Right. With SNPs, it's a, it's a I, I wouldn't even necessarily I don't even know if I'd go as far as to call it a mutation. It's more than a variation, right? It's sort of what makes us all unique. And sometimes that uniqueness. It's not, it doesn't help us nowadays, but it might have helped us 10,000 years ago when we were running around the jungles or where not, whatnot. Um, but these variations, you can, there's workarounds. Uh, you can overcome them with, uh, you know, increasing the amount of substrate that the enzyme needs. So, like, for instance, uh, with MTHFR, it's usually a uh, methylfolate or folinic acid, and it actually in some patients, even folic acid, this, the, the dreaded folic acid that, you know, uh, which, which is a, you know, certainly not what I prefer because it's synthetic, but uh, uh, but you know, some people it's fine, it works great, right? Uh, you basically overcome that variation in enzyme function by increasing the amount of substrate it needs, which is basically giving more of that vitamin, and you can overcome the dysfunction in that enzyme. So essentially, when when their immune um, or when their subtype is based on your clinical experience, immunomethylation, yeah, then there's going to be some form of deficiencies going on because of that economy is not churning like the way it's supposed to, to be doing in the in the normal body. Right. right? Their, their okay. economy is sort of stuck in the depression mm. and we're trying to pull them out. Right. We're trying to get them to like the 1950s or right. you know, yeah. 1980s. So, 80s is probably a bad example. We went into so much <laughs> debt. I don't know if I want to do that. But, you know. but meanwhile, um, conventional medicine sees all these different subtypes as one, which is autism. That's right. it. Right. And well, the one, well, the, the one thing I can say, conventional yeah. medicine does distinguish between syndromic and non-syndromic, mm -hmm. but it changes zero for intervention. So the fact that at least they recognize it, I'll give them that, but that's the end of that. Right. Know? So they're very behind in doctor's office versus what's known now in the research field, right? Essentially. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what do you think is responsible for this explosion of, or the rise of autism um, from one in 10,000, maybe a few years back. I don't know the exact statistics. Maybe you can enlighten me on that. But now it's, what, one in 64 or something? Yeah, one in 65. And I think with boys, it's one in 40. One in 40? Yeah. Wow. The, the, the data is a little behind, and there's some controversy as far as how they collect that. But the bottom line is, and we've all seen this with our own eyes, it's increased significantly. And it's not because... We're better at diagnosing it. It's not because these kids used to be institutionalized. I mean, I think it's always been around, but the, the, the prevalence in this has absolutely gone up. Um, you know, what causes it? I, you know, I wish I knew. Mm -hmm. right? um, I can tell you some of the causes that I suspect. Um, I think the causes are very widespread. Um, I think some of the big ones that I've seen, and, and a lot of these are theories. Um, you know, I don't think we have straight evidence with any of them, but... Uh, but based on when we do an intervention and they get better, you know, that's how we kind of figure it. I think, uh, uh, I think vaccinations, the increase in vaccinations, I don't think it has necessarily a direct cause, but I think it's, especially in the subtypes who have immune dysfunction, mm. you know, you're talking about vaccines are, are 
they're immunomodulatory agents. They're, they're designed to change your immune system. Well, if your immune system is already dysfunctional and you're trying to change it, you can, you can create a mess, you know? So I think in certain kids, uh, I think that contributes, it, contributes to it. Um, you know, I think vaccination is probably safe in a lot of children. Um, you know, personally, I'm very, uh, I think our schedule is way too aggressive in this country. You know, I think you can see how they do it in other countries, like in Japan and whatnot. I think it's, uh, these, your kids seem to be doing okay and with yeah, a less aggressive schedule. Like, so that's I don't know what, how necessary that is, you know. You know, just kind of go along with what we were talking about earlier, um, that in Japan, they, they really kind of follow along the CDC protocol very nicely, but what they did was they just basically um, delayed giving the child right. until the age of two. So no yeah. vaccination prior to age of two. And what they saw was the infant mortality drops significantly right. because Japan is one of those countries that they have negative growth. That's right. They, they, they That's don't right. have enough babies to right. maintain you know, the, the population. So that's you know, something that they really try to figure out. Okay, how do we fix that problem? Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the problems is, uh, the, you know, the immune system is, you know, extremely immature and extremely impressionable up to the age of two. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, and there's even questions about, you know, they, when they give hep B like at birth, mm. I mean, it's even questionable how much of an immune response does the baby even make? Because right. it doesn't really have a functional immune system the first three months. It's living off the mother's sort of borrowed immunity. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, that's a big topic. I, I, I don't want to turn the whole you know, show into that because we could easily talk about that for No, hours for sure. And because it's a, such a sensitive topic, right. it's highly polarized because for some people, it's blasphemy to say right. that you, or to question right. vaccines at all, right? right? At all. They get emotional right away. Right. Like, oh, you're not scientific right, right. away. But... Uh, I don't know because the science aren't very clear on that neither, right? And, right. I mean, and I, I would think that um, you really need to take a harder look. This is a, this is exactly what I told my patients. Yeah, right? and and, I, and mind you, I have a I have a vaccine injured child. Okay, so I'm biased, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I can't. There's no way I can't be biased. And even with that bias, I still think they have value. So, you know, I think the wrong answer would be just throw them out the window. No, I think they're a very valuable tool that we have. But the, pro- the problem I have with it is they've sort of delivered this myth that they're harmless. They're not harmless, you know? Uh, I think for most kids, they're probably fine. I think the kids get them, they do great, fantastic. I, but just like you would do with any sort of medical intervention or medicine that you're gonna prescribe, you evaluate the patient, you do a risk-benefit analysis, and you just say, look, is this, what is the risk for this kid? Well, if we know that the kid's got a mom who has autoimmune disease and the, the sibling already has autism and you, know, you have all these red flags showing up, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. You might want to think about it. Like, well, what if the kid did get chicken pox? He'd itch for a week. <laughs> That's about it. Right. You know, I mean, uh, you know, say there's a smallpox outbreak. Smallpox is deadly. Uh, I have a child with a vaccine reaction. I'd be the first one in line to get my son a vaccine for that. That's a deadly disease. The stakes are high. You know, see, you just you just gotta have the, the and, and this is I think where the pediatricians should be better with their patients as far as looking at risk benefit. But they're it instead it turns into this, you know, oh let's get all these kids within this time period and check it off and make sure they're all, you know, compliant and, and that's it. It, it that, have, that risk benefit conversation as far as I've seen doesn't even happen. Have a more sensible approach. Like, yeah. ask questions, you know, risk factors for... Well, for, treat, like it, you said, treat yeah. it like you would any other medical intervention. <laughs> treat it no different. Uh-huh. That, that's all I would, that's all I say, you know. It's, it became a checkbox. Yeah, it became a checkbox. And Did you get treated, this? Like Did you get else? that? Right. No? Okay, let's schedule you for that? Right. Right. And yeah. that's actually, I mean, actually in adult medicine, that's already, that's starting to happen now too with, you know, aspirin, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker after MI. You know, you, you, you discharge a patient from the hospital, you got that checkbox. Now, so oh, that's, wow. that's actually creeping into other areas of medicine, which, uh, you know, that's again another topic as far as the, 
direction things are going. Oh, right. You know, checkbox, um, checkbox, checkbox I, medicine. I think you know? I think Paul Thomas' work is, is worth mentioning. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. can you tell us a bit about you know what he did? Paul because Thomas basically his, uh, has yeah, a, who he is. Yeah. Yeah. He's a he's a pediatrician out of, in Oregon. He's been practicing for for years, and he created this alternative vaccination schedule, which uh, essentially if if. In, in the group of kids he's been working with, and he's been keeping track of this so far. I think it's over almost 1,200 kids, uh, and in his series of kids, the rate of autism is actually zero, zero out of 1,200, which is pretty impressive. Now, it's not just because they're changing the vaccination schedule that you know. I think it's important to state these are parents that are, uh, you know, seeking out sort of an alternative approach to their child's health. So they're also probably more involved in diet and right. lifestyle and, you know, all those kind of things. More health conscious. Very health conscious, definitely. Um, but anyway, his alternative vaccine schedule, uh, he actually, uh, he eliminates a few of the so-called, uh, well, actually, they're, they're not even required. They're just recommended, not required. But he, he includes a lot of elements of the required vaccine schedules. He changes the order a bit uh, and the timing a bit on it. Uh, and one of the key things he does is if your kid is sick or any problem at all, you don't do it. If they have a fever, if they've, they've even got a little bit of a cough, you just wait. It's a preventative measure. What's the difference if they get it a week later, right? You just wait. Uh, and also, they, he didn't clump multiple ones in one session. If you, if you had got one, you waited a couple of weeks, then you got the other, and the kid had to be good, you know, all, all along. Uh, in addition to that, if, if the child did have an MTHFR variation in his genome, uh, or there was any history of autoimmunity or autism or any kind of developmental delay, basically he recommended in his group you delay vaccinations till the age of five. So, uh, but that, that was his alternative schedule, which is, from the data he's collected, it's working pretty good, and we haven't had any large outbreaks of any you know, communicable diseases or anything up there. So um, I, th I think that's a very uh, useful alternative that he's mm. put out there. and. Um, you know, I, I utilize that schedule with some of my patients. I, I, I give it to them as an option to think about. Um, I usually do it when, the, when I have the parents very adamantly against vaccination, just I'm not going to do it, period. You know, I, 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 try to, I try to steer my patients from both extremes. Right. I don't want them to blindly do it, but I also don't want them to blindly not do it. Mm -hmm. I want them to just look at it, you know, logically and, and, and make a, you know, to kind of together make, make some good decisions on it. Right. So, listeners... Um, we'll link that up in the show notes as far as um, Paul's book. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, it'll be on the link below. Um, let's shift gear a bit. Uh, I want to talk about the relationship between the gut health and autism, or maybe that you can shine some more light on that topic. May, people listening or watching may think, okay, well, how is that even related to anything? Yeah, so this was uh, when I first sort of opened my eyes to this change in field. It kind of hit me like a brick because before that, I had noticed most of the autistic kids I'd seen had gut issues. They were bloated, they had diarrhea yeah. all the time. Never put two and two together. And then once it kind of, uh, as I learned, you know, this paradigm shift you talked about earlier, you know, probably 90% of autistic kids have gut issues, if not higher. Uh, they almost all do to some extent. Uh, a lot of that comes into you know why some of these kids can't be potty trained. You know why you got a seven-year-old boy with diapers on. Um, it's not just the autism. Mm -hmm. You know if, if you got a kid who's with chronic diarrhea, it's tough to potty train someone with that. And it's hard enough for these little guys to <laughs> you know do it normally, right? And right. this is the part where we go talking about poop, right? So uh, uh -huh. poop is hugely important in autism. All right, so let's hear it. It is, uh, and for parents listening, pay attention to your your kids' bowel movements, uh, the consistency of them. It's not normal for your child to be constipated all the time. It's not normal for your child to have, you know, liquidy stools all the time. Uh, people just tend to, I don't, I don't know, they just say, well, that's how my kid poops. Right, yeah, poop but, just yeah, poop, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, you poop. Can't look it that way. Poop's supposed to be, you know, soft, formed, you know, should be every day. Um, a couple times a day is okay, you know, as long as it's not a problem. Uh, but you got to look into that, and so the reason is, is that, you know, that's sort of like looking at the blood to figure out what's going on in the body. You look at the poop to figure out what's going on in the gut. That's the end product of, of what's going on in the gut. So, what are really the connection is really that gut immune brain access. Mm. So, you have, uh, you know, one of the problems in autism is uh, 
leaky blood brain barrier. Okay, you have this barrier on your brain that lets some stuff in, keeps most of the stuff out, especially the bad stuff. Right. And it's a pretty good barrier. It's not a very good barrier when you're an infant. Uh, it's pretty pretty porous at that time, but as you mature, it tightens up. Well, during that time, if you have any kind of insults that can basically cause gut issues or cause a leaky gut, which is a similar concept to which with the blood brain barrier being leaky, you can have your gut being leaky with the same thing, and it, which could be sensitivities to foods, could be inflammation from uh, infections, uh, could be toxins. There's a lot of reasons for it. Um, once you get that leaky gut, you're now bringing in molecules that should not be inside your body. And when that occurs, the immune system is not happy with that. So it responds in kind, and, uh, and a lot of times it confuses things. It, you know, it may confuse a, a gluten molecule for uh, some sort of pathogen that it's trying to uh, affect. And you know, the problem is you eat it every day, you, you keep that inflammatory response up. Well, invariably, uh, through the immune system, th that leaky gut can then lead to having either causing a leaky blood-brain barrier or keeping it uh, persisting. And that also works the other direction. You know, if, if you get hit in the head with a hammer and you mm. get a traumatic brain injury or a concussion or something like that, you immediately, at least transiently, will get a leaky blood-brain barrier. Uh, hopefully everything heals, it tightens up, that's fine. Uh, it, they've done many studies on this. Within hours, they've shown a leaky gut will develop. From so, traumatic head injury? From getting hit in the head with something, yeah. So, so it's a two-way connection. The leaky gut can lead to leaky brain. Leaky brain can lead to leaky gut. So, and sometimes you gotta figure, you know, it's, it's a chicken and an egg question, trying to figure out what's the cause. Um, I would probably say in the autistic kids, it depends. I think uh, in a lot of them, the, the cause is actually the brain causing the gut issues. Um, they have some sort of encephalitis, chronic inflammatory response going into the brain from whatever reason. There's various ones. Um, and then in a lot of other cases, it's the other way around. If it's the gut that's the cause, usually the treatment, uh, the treatment response is usually much quicker, much more dramatic. It's, there's a, we have a lot more tools for uh, sort of healing the gut or restoring the gut with the microbiome, tightening the, the, uh, the gut barrier, all those kind of things. Um, we have some tools also with the brain, it's just they're, you know, they're not as robust, mm. not, not as varied, so. Right, wow, that's fascinating. So the bagel that you eat can literally cause your brain to leaks. I mean. Hopefully not, <laughs> it'd be definitely good, yeah, definitely good. No, yeah, and that's fascinating. Um, so, do you sh you check for gut health for every single autistic kid? Essentially, well, almost all of them. I, I have a few that don't really have any symptoms whatsoever, uh -huh. and if on exam, you know, I, I mean, they're not bloated at all. I mean, so, but but I would say almost all. Yes, almost and, all. And and once you start to treat them, um, what kind of improvement do you see? That's. That's varied. Um, I mean, what, what I can tell you is my own clinical experience has been the full gamut of no response to recovery and everything in between. And I think it depends on a lot of factors. I think it depends what is the actual subtype or cause. How well can we intervene there? Um, how much compliance on the parent's part? Because it's usually the, you know, it's, it's not a take a pill and forget it type in approach. It, I wish it was that easy, but it's almost never that way. Um, there may be some pills involved, but there's usually very intensive dietary interventions, uh, a, quite a lot of uh, th uh, rehab therapy. Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in functional neurology and uh, functional neurological rehab. Uh, I think it's great, like for primitive reflex remediation, those kind of things. Uh, so it's, it, it's a uh, fairly involved program for the parents. Um, but assuming that that's in place, you know, we know the subtype, uh, then there's the uh, age that we get the child. You know, the younger the child, I would say, definitely the better the response. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I personally haven't seen any recoveries in older kids. I've seen a lot of improvements. Um, 
the recoveries that I've been involved in have really been in kids that have presented at three, four years old, in, around there. So the younger, the, there's more plasticity in the brain. I mean, you know, this is the big buzzword now. You know, we have plasticity till we're 100. Yeah, we do, but three and four year olds have better plasticity, okay? As, and, and two year olds have even better plasticity. So I think we all knew that, right? Um, you know, as we get older, we, we do get a little rusty, but not as rusty as we thought we did, right? And I think the problem of um, the mechanistic view or the current conventional paradigm of medicine is it zoom in too, too much. You, you're looking at the body, let's say if there's a liver problem or um, for example, um, pancreas problem like uh, diabetes. You just zoom in and look at that. So okay, this guy's not producing insulin. We're just gonna give them insulin shots. Right. But that is not how it works because the function of the pancreas is also related to other function and other systems of the body. Well, right. it makes the big assumption that the insulin is doing nothing anywhere else but to the pancreas, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be awesome if it really worked that way in our body, but it, it very, I would probably go as far as to say nothing works that way in our body. I think that approach is useful, and the reason I think why it's still being used is it's useful in acute settings where somebody comes in and they've got a hemorrhage to their liver because they got stabbed or something like that. Yeah, sure, you got to focus all your efforts on that area where there's an injury and do whatever you got to do to fix that. That's acute medicine, you know. Absolutely. That's where medicine shines acutely. Right. They've taken that that paradigm and applied it to chronic medicine and just said, "Well, it works fantastic in acute medicine. Let's do it in chronic medicine. It probably work the same." No. It doesn't work the same. It doesn't really work well at all. And that's and again, that's where conventional medicine fails, is in the, in the chronic, uh, treating chronic conditions. Um, I, I don't think it has to keep failing. Uh, I think it just has to be open to changing mm. its viewpoint. Yeah. And that viewpoint is, like you said, it's one big complicated systems biology, complex system. Uh, right. That's, and and you know, you, you're kind of that butterfly effect, you know, you do one little thing here and who knows, it, it could, have repercussions in another system much bigger. A, a more holistic approach. Absolutely. Yeah, like right. you're absolutely right. Like crisis intervention have its time and place. If right. I break a leg, I'm not going to go see a chiropractor. I'm right. going to go emergency room. And get it set and then yeah, it'll heal. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of want to jump into the next questions. For, for parents or soon to be a parent or young parents out there, um, what can they do to lower their child's risk for uh, autism? Yeah, so first off, I think this is the most high yield area by far. So if we want to eliminate autism or reduce the rates, the most high yield way by far is preconception counseling as far as we get the health of the mom and dad as healthy as possible before the child is conceived. Before. That's an important one. Uh, you know, prenatals, nice too, um, you know, as far as before the baby's born, while the mom's conceiving, it's better than nothing, but preconception is the way to go. You, you know, going into the pregnancy, uh, we want the mom to be as healthy as she can. If, if she needs to be detoxed, you know, we're, we're not doing it while she's pregnant and we're not doing it while she's breastfeeding, you know, it's, it needs to be done beforehand. Um, you know, I think ideally, uh, you know, the longer the better, of course, but uh, actually three to six months, I think in someone of, of average health, I would say, you know, not too unhealthy or toxic or whatnot, uh, you, can, you can get pretty far there. And I think some of the, again, depends on the patient, you know, what their issues are, where their variations are genetically, uh, what kind of symptoms they have. But I think some of the general high yield things that you can do is number one, uh, you know, get on, some kind of omega-3 or fish oil or something. Um, you know, I, I think the pendulum is swinging. There's so many people now doing it. I think we're imbalancing it in some people too far the other way. But for the vast majority of Americans, vast majority, vast vast majority, <laughs> take fish oil because you're getting a lot more omega sixes than threes. And it's it's not that sixes are bad and threes are good. It's, it's about balance. It's about balance. For most people, the balance is way off in, in upwards of twenty to one. Okay, and this is what makes our membranes. Okay, our cell membranes. Our cell membranes, that's where all the action happens. That's where all the receptors are. You know, everybody always talks about the nucleus, the mitochondria. Yeah, they're all important. But the membrane, if 
if you can't, if the membrane's dysfunctional, the communication breaks down, okay? And it, communication is uh, just like in the real world. If the phones are down, if you can't communicate with people, things don't work as well. And the body's, the body's no different. So that's where the, uh, the, the healthy fats come in. Omega-3s are part of it, but um, also your uh, essential fatty acids, your linoleic, linolenic, uh, the, um, uh, just a good balance of fats, staying away from processed fats. Uh, you know, the, the, that whole aisle in the store, the corn oil, soybean oil, Horrible. cotton seed oil, the ones that, you know, anything that can sit on the shelf for like two years. And, and here's a good tip here. If you burn the oil and it doesn't smell bad, that means it was deodorized, okay? Which means it was probably rancid on the shelf to begin with and you couldn't smell it. When you burn oil, it's supposed to smell bad. It's supposed to smell so bad that you don't want to eat the food because that's how bad the stuff is for you. There's a reason why we evolved that sense for rancid oil. Uh, industries got around that. The, the, they you know, deodorized these oils, and uh, I, I think that they play a very large role, actually, I think, in, in not just in autism, but in lots of problems. So that would be the first thing. I think second thing is getting on some sort of good prenatal vitamin, and, and I would actually look for non-synthetic sources of, of these uh, vitamins, specifically... Um, because the MTHFR mutation is so prevalent in, uh, in our population, up to upwards of 40 to 50% of people can have it. Some form of methylfolate um, or folinic acid, preferably over folic acid. Now, it's one, you know, folic acid actually is fine for probably most people, but there's that small subset that it, it really just sort of hangs around and doesn't get converted. You know, the, the, the methylfolate is a, it's relatively inexpensive, not as cheap as folic acid, but it's still cheap things considered the fact that we now have the natural form of it readily available why would you take the synthetic mm -hmm. that's the way I look at it and, and that's my viewpoint really on all most supplements if, if you can get it in its natural form what, what's the point of taking a synthetic uh, through food yeah, yeah. It, well that's, that's ideal the best food is the ideal best. form yeah. yeah if you can down a couple of cups of spinach a day <laughs> yeah, you'll get all you need you know um, but yeah, I mean, diet, uh, well, that, and I was going to get to that next with gut. Um, so gut health, I think, is another important point going into preconception where, again, the bowel movements. I hate to get, come back to poop again, but uh, it, it, it's, you've got to have bowel movements every day. You can't be constipated. Can't be can't have diarrhea uh, more than every so often you know, for whatever reason. But um, that is a huge indicator of gut health. You know, you gotta, you got to keep an eye on these things. And, you know, don't get obsessed about it, but you, you just keep note. A little notation in the back of your head. You shouldn't be bloated. You maybe occasionally you ate something wrong, but on a regular basis, you shouldn't be bloated. You shouldn't have abdominal pain on a regular basis. You, know, you shouldn't have you shouldn't have anything on a regular basis. <laughs> you just you just shouldn't. You know, people are too quick to accept these things as that's the way I am. That's not the way you are. You were born to be this beautiful, health optimized, you know, individual. Okay, we're all born to be that. And then along the way, some of us get dealt, you know, easy cards for it. Some of us get dealt, you know, hard cards for it. Some of us got to work at it a little more. But, but that's what we're all, we all have that same potential. And, but if, if you're not expecting that, if, if you kind of resign yourself to just, eh, you know, I don't feel too good, it's okay. Well, you'll never get there. Right. You never will. And unfortunately, with that attitude, your child will suffer, you know. Mm. So I think if, if for no other reason, just... During the time you're conceiving or breastfeeding, do it for your kid at least. Mm -hmm. Then go back to enjoying your suffering. That's fine. That's that's up to no, you. No, but that know? that's so. huge because um, so if a, a woman a woman that's expecting or, or plan to have a baby, and she has autoimmune issues, gut issues, celiac, um, brain fog, maybe thyroid issues, that can play a huge role as far as increasing the risk Absolutely. factor Absolutely. for the child to have some kind of autism. Right. I mean, they've got different studies out where they, and, and it varies, but, so I don't know what the real numbers are, but the bottom line is, if the mom has an autoimmune condition, you, the chance for having an autistic child goes up. It doesn't go up from one in a thousand. We're talking up from one in 62, from the baseline amount, which is not that rare. Okay? Right. So, uh, you know, how many moms out there have a Hashimoto's? or yeah. low-grade lupus, or even just a, a positive ANA. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of, you know, pre-autoimmune conditions, you know. I hate using the word pre, by the way, but, you know, anytime you tell a patient pre, 
you're asking them to ignore the problem, right? Because pre means before, right? But I don't have it yet. That's right, I don't have it yet, so I don't need to do anything. So, uh, you know, autoimmunity is another one that's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by the time your you know, fingers going sideways from the rheumatoid arthritis, it's probably gone on 25 years, you know? So there's, you know, we try to, we try to catch that in the clinic as far as uh, does this person have a, have a ponderance towards autoimmunity, especially if they're going into pregnancy with that. Uh, you, you don't want that that immune dysfunction necessarily to be shared with the child, and if possible, we can, you know we can tone it down, mm. and and that's where the gut health comes in. Uh, it, you know, probably I'd say eight out of ten times, if we can get the gut stuff in order, you know, the, the eighty percent of the immune system lives in the gut. If we can basically get the gut to function the way we want to, you know, normally function, good microbiome, everything, that sets the tone for how the immune system is gonna work in the rest of the body. So we use the gut as a, as, a, as a vehicle or as a window to basically treat the immune system. Because you know, we can't necessarily treat the immune system directly. Right. We can in some ways, um, but you know, usually when you do that, like through biologics, like Humira or Enbrel, things like that, I mean, and they work. They, they work very well. Um, but you're, you're really turning off something that you don't wanna turn off. Uh, you, you, you need your immune system. But you need it to work right, and you know I think with autoimmunity, it's uh, it's not about too much, too little. It's about wrong and right. So, so I, I don't know how to make it work right, but I do know how to make someone's gut better. And and I tell this to my patients all the time: your body is a thousand times smarter than I am. I'm just here to lead it in the right way, and the body works it out. But we got to lead it to the right place, mm. and that's kind of how we do it. Right, and not only that people who are diagnosed with autoimmune conditions have a much higher um, chance of being diagnosed with cancer late in life. So you can mm -hmm. kind of see the link between you know, immunity and cancer. Right. And right. now more studies are showing cancer is an immune issues, essentially. But that's a whole... Especially if you put them on a biologic. Yeah. Then that, the cancer really goes up. That's, uh, that's a whole different show right mm -hmm. there. Right. So, um, all right. Um, what's your favorite resource or when it comes to autism, or for, you know, not maybe not um, like medical research or, or right. journal, just for lay people to, to go and check out. I think I think for uh, parents and, and patients and uh, you know kind of non practitioners that are interested, uh, I like there's a website or a group called the Autism Exchange. Um, it's actually a group that's uh, basically put together by a um, it's an autism dad. He's uh, he's two boys who have autism. Uh, used to be a rocket scientist at NASA. Uh, this is true. <laughs> I met the guy. He's, he's a nice guy. Um, anyway, he, you know, when when he was going through his journey, uh, kind of deciphering all this, he would spend hours going through Google searches. You know, wading through. Some information was useful. Some was not useful. Some was even harmful. You know, so. And he always said, he goes, you know, I, I wish there was some place that could just consolidate all of this. He made it. What was it called? Yeah, uh, it's theautismexchange.com. Okay. And it's, uh, he actually gives some great discounts if you join up. And um, it's, I'm not sure what it costs, but it's, it's relatively inexpensive. But the most important, the, the thing I find most useful on the site, the discounts are nice, certainly for parents. But uh, the way he has the search set up. Um, when you search, you know, a lot of websites, if you put it in the search box, it just runs a Google search. There's nothing special about it. He actually created it, he tweaked it, and I don't, I'm not a coder, I don't know exactly how he did this, but he tweaked it so that it would go by categories and it gives much more relevant information for parents that are seeking uh, information on treatments. And it's not just biomedical or functional medicine stuff. I mean, it's the whole gamut of therapies and you know, we didn't really talk much about therapies today. I mean, that's, I, I wanna make one thing clear, I think, before the show's done is uh, uh, this the biomedical functional medical, medical approach I think is essential for kids with autism with therapy they have to be in therapy okay it's got to be some kind of therapy now what kind of you know ABA works for some kids I don't personally like it for my kid but uh, we did Sunrise uh, there's RDI there's there's all kinds there's floor time for younger kids there's but some, the kids gotta be in some form of therapy because what we're, what we're doing medically is toning down the inflammation, trying to get the immune system right. Well, plasticity, as you know, 
only works, you can get everything right, with, but without stimulation, you don't make new synapses. The stimulation has to be there. And I don't mean like, you know, hooking up an electrode to the head. And sti I mean stimulation like making the kid talk, making the kid write, making the kid walk a straight line, making the kid wh whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do. Uh, so, so therapy is an absolute essential, it's, but it's a, you know, that's, that's another piece of it. So. Right, some form of motor control exercises right. or whatever that may be. Yeah, whatever to, to it may be. Kind of in um, conjunction with what you're right, doing. Right, okay. and, uh, and uh, how that ties in with autism exchanges, like I said, it's uh, through the search, they'll, they'll give you information on lots of different things. I think that's a good resource right. for parents. Yeah. One thing, too, um, I want to touch on and ask you, because we talk about gut health pretty much the entire time, probiotics. What do you use and you know, what brand and how much? I like, if you can get the kid to eat it, uh, homemade sauerkraut. Yeah. If they don't have a candida overgrowth and you can get them to eat it, homemade sauerkraut's fantastic. It, you know, if, if the kid's got candida, be careful because the advantage of sauerkraut is you know, you'll get this ridiculous amount of colony forming units per ounce. I've read estimates up towards of a trillion, okay, with a T. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you can't buy a probiotic like that, right? <laughs> so, and that's great. And it's actually, they've also shown that there's a pretty good diversity in sauerkraut because the cabbage, assuming it was organic, you know, it was on the ground. If you imagine if you stretched out all the different convolutions of a cabbage into a sheet, it'd probably be as big as this room, right? So you have this huge surface area that's been laying on the ground for months, collecting all these soil based organisms. And you ferment it and you get all kinds of cool stuff growing in there, including candida. So, again, I'm going to say that again. If anyone wants to start feeding their kids sauerkraut, just make sure they don't have candida, please. Um, anyway, assuming they don't, sauerkraut, fantastic. I love it. Okay. Uh, if you can't get the kid to eat sauerkraut, um, I use various different combinations of things depending kind of what we're trying to do. I like Zymogen's uh, ProBiomax line, uh, they have a great line. It's their high colony count one is six, 16 species, 600 billion units at the time of manufacture, 350 billion units at time of expiration. That's about the highest one I've found. Right. Um, I've had good luck with that. I like, uh, I like Prescript Assist uh, as a soil-based probiotic. I, as I don't, alone, I don't like it. I, I like it as a part of a kind of uh, integrative approach to the gut. And uh, Megaspore Biotics, another one I like for spore-based. I don't think it's for everyone. I, I think in the right patient, it's it's a good one. You just got to figure out who that patient is. So um, that's the usual approach in the younger kids uh, of the under two. Uh, Claire uh, makes some good infant probiotic formulas. I think it's important to realize that kids under two are supposed to have a different microbiome than older kids. They're not. It's, it's not that a one-year-old has a miniature version of an adult microbiome. It's just different. It, well, it depends on what they eat. You got a kid that's being exclusively breastfed, he doesn't need half the bugs that we need to basically extract nutrition out of these complex foods. So, so it depends a lot, uh, you know, if it's a formula fed baby versus breastfed, the microbiome changes pretty dramatically. Um, so yeah, so it also depends on the age, mm -hmm. and, you know, where we're going with it. But those are kind of the main ones I like to use. So. Awesome. Um, where can people reach you and find you if they want to learn more about uh, we have, practice? Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're open to see new patients here in Henderson, which, uh, um, you know, we, you can call us at 702-616-4001 or uh, online. We have a website at uh, www.southwestfunctionalmedicine.com. We can learn more information about the practice, what we do. Uh, you know, we're on Facebook, um, probably the other places too. I'm not really sure exactly where, but do you do yeah. um, like telemedicine, like online consultation? Sure. Yeah, we do FaceTime or Skype consults for people out of town. Um, I prefer to see them at least once live, so I can examine them. But it's not essential. Um, it, it depends again on the problem. Um, but uh, yeah, we do do that. Um, I, but one thing with the telemedicine, I do try to convince patients if, if they're coming out to Vegas anyway to at least come for an initial visit. It, it helps me a lot so I can give a better evaluation if, if I can get a good clinical examination and uh, that's to me it's a, a very important part of the evaluation. So Absolutely, so yeah. definitely check that out at southwestfunctionalmedicine.com so um, we'll put in the show note and also in the link below. Um, thank you so much for coming. Sure, on. absolutely. One last question. What does wellness mean to you? Wellness. Yeah. yeah. I think wellness is uh, kind of what I mentioned earlier. I think we all 
I think we're born to be the best that we can be. And that's what we should all strive for. Um, I, think, I think it's a journey for us to learn what that is first, what we're capable of. But uh, you have to always strive for it. And, and not just physically. Um, I mean, the whole you know, multi-layered um, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, they're, all, they're, all, they're not separate. They're all tied in together. And I think you have to have all those components together. Um, I think in most of us, it starts with physical, though. When you feel good physically, then you feel good mentally. You feel good mentally, you're not emotionally a grouch or snappy or whatever, you know. And, and then that opens the, the window to, to, you know, spiritually being uh, balanced and, and reaching whatever it is you're trying to reach. Um, I think sometimes people get lost with when they think of wellness. They feel overwhelmed and they're like, oh, I got this, 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 this. Just keep it simple, you know. The first step is uh, you're not supposed to feel like crap every day, okay? <laughs> you're not, period. And if you do, something's wrong. So the first step is you get the physical together, and then it all kind of come together. But it's, uh, it, it's more complex. Uh, it, it, it's got a lot of layers to it, I think. But uh, I think people get overwhelmed because they, they try to tackle everything at once. You know, they're, they're, they're going to yoga, and they're meditating, and they're... Uh, taking these supplements, they're doing this, they're doing that, you know, just, if that's too much for you, then take it a step back, just start with that knee that's bothering you, you know, take care of your knee, and when that's better, move on to something else, and work on your gut, work on whatever, it's a, it's a, it's a project, it's a marathon, it doesn't happen in six months, uh, it may not even happen in a year, some people, it can take years to reach it, but once you reach it, the prize is worth it, you know, life is good, you feel good, you know, I think I'm well, I love waking up every morning, you know, I love coming to work. And, and I didn't always feel that way, you know, I've, I've had my challenges along the way. I think everybody is capable of that, including the little guys, including the little guys with autism. Uh, they're all capable of it. And we just, we just have to have hope for them. And, and as, as, as a parent of an autistic child and other parents listening to this, if you don't have hope for your child, nobody does. You are, that is your job, to have hope for your child. You need to have hope for them because if you're not, you're not going to give it to them, they're not going to get it from anybody else. Thank you. All right. Dr. Nick Sure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.